أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم يا كريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept your amal, to accept your deeds, to accept all it is that you are doing in this month, um, and first and foremost, to accept the struggle. Bihaq Muhammad wa alihi tayyibin tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alihi Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum ya kareem. For the past few days, my brothers and sisters, we were in the realm of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam trying to take from Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam that nur that he would give off to all those that try to pursue him. We spoke about the value of Imam al-Hasan, the merit of Imam al-Hasan. We spoke about the value system and, and how does a human being um, hold value and where does that value come from or stem from. We also spoke about the characteristics that make a leader a leader and how Imam al-Hassan exemplified these characteristics. And we said that human beings after a stage of moral development or humanistic development, I would say, they pursue leadership in the one that holds high morals and values and, and moral traits in general, not necessarily someone who is physically strong or the most knowledgeable of the pack. Rather, after a while, after... Um, a step forward in human advancement, human beings tend to gravitate towards someone with high moral characteristics. And Imam al-Hassan exemplified that on more than one occasion to the degree that he was, um, he was called Karim Ahl al-Bayt. Just to be Ahl al-Bayt is an honor, but to be the generous one of Ahl al-Bayt is a distinction. Yesterday, my brothers and sisters, we we discussed Sulh al-Hasan, the peace treaty of Imam al-Hasan. We looked at it through a historical sense. We analyzed some aspects of it. We said Imam al-Hasan had at one point the pretty much the whole Arabian Peninsula other than Syria and maybe some other parts, um, you know, in, his, in, his, in the palm of his hand. And then after Muawiyah uh, schemed and planned, and he was known to be very, very sly and cunning, after he schemed and planned and put his plan into action, he was able to narrow down the supporters of Imam al-Hassan, maybe I would say then to less than a hundred or less than a thousand. Allahu alam how much they were, but they were the minority of the minority of the minority, if we would say, the Shias that were actually loyal to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. All of the other people in the army dispersed. Some of them were there, we said, for material gain. Some of them were there for cultural reasons, traditional reasons. They... The heads of the tribes were fighting with Imam al-Hassan and therefore the people that were in the tribe were following their leaders um, blindly. We said that some of them were khawarij. They wanted anything just to get at Muawiyah, just like they were trying to do anything to get at Amir al-Mu'mineen salam and they eventually succeeded killing him in Masjid al-Kufa. In the same way, they wanted to get to Muawiyah. And so these, these different groups of people were with Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam initially in the army of Imam al-Hassan and Muawiyah was able to buy them out very, very easily. Even some of the closest people to Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, rather family members, some scholars say, were bought out like Ubaidullah ibn Abbas who was the cousin of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam and it is said when he was bought out by Muawiyah, he was bought out as some of the ulama say for a million dinar or dirham and he took with him 8,000 soldiers from the soldiers of Imam al-Hassan. And when Imam al-Hassan appointed another, uh, another leader of the army after his cousin, that same leader also took the bribe and he betrayed Imam al-Hassan. So Imam al-Hassan was facing betrayal on every, in every single direction until Imam al-Hassan had no supporters. He chose to make a peace treaty which would realistically give Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, the caliphate, but with conditions that Muawiyah was, for example, to give the khilafah to Imam al-Hassan or Imam al-Hussein alayhi salamullah after his death, that he was not to hurt the Shias, he was not to persecute the Shias or Imam al-Hassan, he was to follow the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, etc, etc, etc. All of this to expose Muawiyah. And what happened was, we said, the first sermon or one of the first sermons that Muawiyah gives 
after Sulh al Hassan is that he says, What me and Al Hassan agreed upon is under my feet. I did not want to become the king or the ruler over you for you to pray or give charity. Rather, I became the ruler over you too, just have power and authority over you. In doing so, Imam al Hassan salam, exposed Muawiyah for, for who he truly was. And the people now knew who Bani Umayyah were and that they were just sitting on the throne of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for power. And just like, just like their forefathers, they merely saw what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accomplished as an empire, as a kingdom, as a kingdom. Man yunazi'una mulk Muhammad, as they used to say, who is going to stand in front of us and take away from us the kingdom of Muhammad, not Rasulullah Muhammad. So they were following those very same footsteps and it became clear for the people and ultimately gave Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in the eyes of the objective academic reader, it gave legitimacy for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to call for the Khilafah in his name because practically speaking, Muawiyah gave him the Khilafah when he signed that peace treaty. So Imam al Hassan's actions and his decision made way, made way for the events that are to come that would ultimately, ultimately, number one, give the Shias their strength. Number two, save Islam. And number three, give you and me our identity. And so Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam's decision and that peace treaty is the reason why me and you are here and I'm talking to you behind this computer and you're actually listening to the words that I say. And whenever a scholar says, Qala Rasulullah, then know that you owe Imam al Hassan and I owe Imam al Hassan alayhi salam uh, that hadith. And if it wasn't for Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, we would not say Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salam. For the love of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, let's have a lot of salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa salam. Jameel. We're going to keep moving forward on our journey, my brothers and sisters, understanding Islam in the holistic manner, talking about these different topics that are fundamental, but we're going to dwell in depth into them, inshallah ta'ala. Today, my brothers and sisters, we want to discuss the ultimate, ultimate goal of the human being in this world, the ultimate, ultimate goal of the many, many years that we spend on this earth where a person can pray and fast and do all of the ibadat, but if they don't have this one thing, then the value of such ibadat may not live up to what the person actually thinks that they're going to live up to. And that is alim, knowledge. Where we said in the other previous sessions that a person's ibadah is directly relative to the ma'rifah, the understanding that they have. And a person's ibadah worship gets its value from the ma'rifah that this individual has. Where if a person does not have ma'rifah, knowledge or understanding, their ibadah itself is meaningless or has very little fruit, very little meaning. And that's why you find Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam when they compare al-abid to al-alim, the servant or the slave, the worshiper, to al-alim, the scholar or the knowledgeable one. They say that it's, or you actually feel that there's almost no comparison where they say the ink of a scholar is better in the eyes of God than the blood of a shaheed, a martyr. Where they say a person that contemplates, for example, for a moment in time, sa'a, afdal min ibadat, it's better than worshipping several amount of years, years, my brothers and sisters. So you find Ahl al-Bayt insisted, insisted on seeking knowledge when it comes to spiritual perfection. When it comes to the ultimate goal that Allah Ta'ala created us for, and that is worship. That is spiritual perfection, spiritual completion. Ahl al-Bayt really, really, really drove this idea and more or less carved it into the books of Ahadith that knowledge is the path towards spiritual perfection. If a person has no knowledge, they're not going to achieve spiritual perfection. And in the Hadith of Imam al-Sadiq, the famous Hadith, called Hadith Anwan al-Basri, 
the Imam draws this connection clear to us and not only draws it, tells us why. This hadith, my brothers and sisters, is extremely, extremely, extremely valuable, extremely important and very heavy, very heavy, very valuable in the meanings that it holds. And it's a very famous hadith, a very famous hadith that our scholars even told us, some of them even ordered their students that you should read this hadith after every salat to that degree because of the meanings that it holds. And because the Imam alayhi salam draws the connection here between worship and knowledge and tells us of what it means to be a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how ultimately, ultimately that serves a human being in their pursuit of knowledge and how their pursuit of knowledge ultimately creates in that human being the soul of servitude, the spirit of servitude to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tonight, my brothers and sisters, what we are going to do is we are going to analyze Hadith Anwan al-Basri from a spiritual sense, from the advice that the ulama give when it comes to Anwan al-Basri and what they derive from Hadith Anwan al-Basri in terms of the, uh, the advice, the spiritual advice, and also from the academic sense. Also from the academic sense, because in the end, it's a Hadith. And a hadith are to be analyzed academically in terms of their sources, in terms of their sanad. Yes, yes, for the level that we're discussing in and for the level of this poor soul, I'm nobody to speak of the sanad of a hadith. But more or less, I'm going to give the opinions of the ulama about the, the, the chain of narrators of this hadith. And also, also more or less gives us a general understanding about how our ulama dwell into and sort of dissect the hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam in terms of their meaning from one perspective and also in terms of their uh, authentication through the uh, the chain of narrators. So inshallah we're going to dwell into this, try to get a deep understanding, but before it we're going to have a loud salat Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. Jami. So we have hadith Unwan al-Basri. As we said, Hadith Anwan al-Basri is a very famous hadith. Some ulama, some ulama, they say, it is said that Sayyid al-Qadi, rahmatullah alayh, used to advise his students to read Hadith Anwan al-Basri after every salah. And it's as if he used to say, as if he used to mean that a person is not truly a student of Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam or talib alim, one who strives and struggles for knowledge, unless they have analyzed and implemented Hadith Anwan al-Basri. And so you find the likes of Sayyid Adil al-Alawi, you find other ulama as well, come forward and do lectures, not just one, like series of lectures online, deciphering, discussing, dissecting Hadith Anwan al-Basri. When they come forward and they look at the Hadith in terms of its chain of narrators, putting aside the meanings, they come forward and they say, Hadith Anwan al-Basri is narrated by Anwan al-Basri. Anwan al-Basri, my brothers and sisters, was a person that lived at the time of Imam al-Sadiq. And when you dwell into Anwan al-Basri, you actually find that Anwan al-Basri was not Shia. He was not from the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, at least, at least in the beginning of the Hadith. Rather, you find that, that Anwan al-Basri, as a narrator of Hadith, only narrated this Hadith from the Imam alayhi salam. So there isn't much information about who Anwan al-Basri is. From Matn al-Hadith, from the actual text of the Hadith, we start to know certain things about Anwan al-Basri, some things about Anwan al-Basri. Some of them help us in authenticating the Hadith. Some of them don't. Some of them actually serve against us. One of those things being is that he wasn't a Shia at the very beginning. At the end, he learns the words of Ahl al-Bayt or hears the words of Imam al-Sadiq but we don't know if he actually becomes a Shia. And so, and so the Hadith itself, they call it Mursal. Mursal. Meaning what? Meaning what? In terms of the, narrate, the chain of narrators, it may not be authentic within itself when you just analyze it from the chain of narrators because it's cut off, essentially. Essentially, the hadith is cut off. Not that it's not authentic. More or less, we don't know if it's authentic. When it comes to analyzing it through the chain of narrators. 
only when you analyze it through the chain of narratives. Are there other means for us to make it authentic or consider it to be somewhat authentic? Yes and no. Maybe more or less we're going to be in the gray zone. What do I mean by that? From the words themselves, from the words of the hadith themselves, we can take Take some things from them and say and say that the Imam salam, does speak in this nature or the words of the hadith itself do correspond with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. And so there is no reason for us to totally throw out this hadith, number one. Number two, when you see that many ulama actually narrate the hadith, it does give some legitimacy, some credibility to the hadith itself in terms of the meaning itself although it was narrated by a person that is almost unknown and he is anwan al basri number 3 when you come and see what the ulama how how much importance the ulama have given this hadith like the likes of uh, sayyid ali al qadi and sayyid adil al alawi who are great ulama that lived in najaf and were known when you see such individuals such scholars give great importance to this hadith then you can't bear but understand that these ulama saw value in the words that are being given and being, you know, more or less narrated to us, whether they are exactly from the imam, 100% from the imam or not. The words that the, um, the narration sort of comprises of is enough for us to take them as advice to live by. When you look at some of the narrators of this hadith, the scholars that narrated this hadith, well, number one, you have Alam al Majlisi in Bihar al Anwar. Number two, we have Sheikh al Baha'i in his Kashkul. By the way, this word Kashkul is more or less a, a, a notebook that many of the scholars used to write many, many different things, um, whether it was jurisprudential things, uh, poetry, historical points here and there, um, philosophical ideas that just came to the mind. It was more or less the notebook that accompanied a scholar their entire lives. And many, many scholars have kashakil, a kashkul. So they write in this book, just notes, just things that more or less they've seen and they want to keep, you know, keep with them. And this book after their death was, would be published. In Sheikh al-Baha'i's kashkul, you find this hadith. So Sheikh al-Baha'i himself, Sheikh al-Baha'i himself actually gave importance to this hadith. In Wasail al-Shia, you also find it as well. In Mishkat al-Anwar, Lisabt al-Shaykh al-Tabrasi and Mishkat al-Anwari also find this hadith. So you find that this hadith was narrated a lot. With this, with this, the ulama made a distinction, made it clear. And they said, Unwan la unwan ala. Unwan al-Basri has no title. We don't know if he's, if he's a trusted source. We don't know if he's from the Shia. We don't know if he's from the, the, our brothers and sisters. We don't know much about him. And so, in terms of the narrator himself, we can't come forward and say the hadith is authentic within itself. But the, the hadith itself takes legitimacy from al-matin, from the words and the message that the hadith gives. Jami. I wanted to dwell into that, my brothers and sisters, to expose us to these ideas, to expose us to the ulama and how they think and how they analyze the hadith, and for us to more or less get a general understanding of this alim, alim al-hadith. I'm no one to, to, to speak about it because I'm not at that level, but I more or less give you what the ulama said. Jameel, let's begin with the hadith, inshallah, analyzing it with Allah Salaam Muhammad, Allah Muhammad. Jameel. Hadith begins. Allah Salaam Muhammad, Allah Muhammad. Hadith begins. Qala Anwan al-Basri. Anwan al-Basri says, Kuntu akhtalif ila Malik ibn Anas Sineen. He says, I used to go to Malik ibn Anas Sinin. Malik ibn Anas was a prominent scholar at the time of Imam al-Sadiq and he was known to be from our brothers and sisters, our Sunni brothers and sisters. He used to teach, whether he taught aqaid, beliefs, or he taught fiqh, jurisprudence, he was a prominent scholar at that time and had many students, many people go to him and learn from him. Kuntu akhtalif ila Malik ibn Anas Sinin. He did not used to go to him just in the off, you know, in the off day. He used to go to him for years. And so Anwan al-Basri was a student of religion. He was not an ordinary man. He was a student of religion. He engrossed himself in this knowledge. And he used to go to 
the different scholars for years, one of them being Malik ibn Anas. When Jafar al-Sadiq came to Medina, when Imam Jafar al-Sadiq came to Medina, I went to him and I tried to go to him multiple times. And I would and I loved to take from Imam al-Sadiq the same way that I took from Malik. Keep this in mind. The same way that I took from Malik, I used to like to take from Imam As-Sadiq. Jameel. لي يوما, as I was sitting with Imam As-Sadiq one day, he said to me, just fix this here. He said to me, إِنِّي رَجُلٌ مَطْلُوبٌ وَمَعَ ذَلِكْ لِي أَوْرَادْ فِي كُلِّ سَاعَةٍ مِنْ آنَاءِ اللَّيْمِ وَالنَّهَارِ فَلَا تَشْغُلْنِي عَنْ وَرْدِي وَخُذْ عَنْ مَالِي The Imam alayhi salam says, essentially, I have things I must do in the daytime, in the nighttime. I have tasks I must complete. And I can't have you, I can't have you in front of me always wanting to take from me. Now you look and say, what is the Imam alayhi salam saying? He's essentially telling this person not to take from him anymore. The Imam alayhi salam says, now why? More or less tells us the reason why almost. He says, So go back to Malik and take from Malik. It's as if the Imam is saying this. He's saying, if you want true knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, if you want the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, you can't take from the opposing side as well the knowledge of Islam. In other words, in other words, we in other where the person who wants to take from Ahlul Bayt السلام, has to know that they are the source of Islam only. And if somebody wants to take the words of Ahlul Bayt, they must put aside the words of those who oppose Ahlul Bayt, the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. Alayhimsalamullah. Sure, to take, for example, to learn Arabic with someone who's not who's not from the school of Ahlul Bayt, okay, no problem. To even to learn the general tafsir of the Qur'an, the general tafsir of the Qur'an, what the ayah is trying to say in its superficial meaning, sure, sure. But when it comes to ma'alim al-deen, when it comes to the aqa'id, when it comes to the faqih, taking from both and saying that I'm taking from Jafar al-Sadiq, purely from Jafar al-Sadiq, while I'm taking and accepting, not merely just learning, accepting the ideas, of those who oppose Ahl al-Bayt salam is essentially not taking from Ahl al-Bayt salam Imam salam it's as if he was trying to make this clear to him. That if you want to take from Ahl al-Bayt salam Allah, then you must put aside those who oppose Ahl al-Bayt and the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt salam You must put aside what they believe in or what they call to because in essence, they are contradicting ideas. To take from them, just to learn, to know the different theories that are out there, to know how to refute these ideas, to understand them for your knowledge is not wrong within itself. It is said as Shahid al-Awwal or Shahid al-Thani, if not both of them, used to know the ahkam, the rulings, the ideas of al-Mukhalifin, of those that are not Shia, not Shia. But more or less, they used to do them for two reasons. For them to know what they are saying is true and for them to be able to communicate and understand where this person is coming from so that they can more or less understand why this person thinks in the way that they think, which is not wrong within itself. What the Imam is saying is a person, if they want the true knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, they have to take from Ahlul Bayt alone and not take and believe from what is said by their enemies. And that's why we say, that's why we say, At-tabarru' min a'ada'illah comes first min at-tawalli li awliya'illah. What do I mean by this? We mean putting aside the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, cutting ourselves from the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, renouncing the enemies of Ahlul Bayt is the first step to actually having wilaya of Ahlul Bayt, in other words, in other words, a prerequisite to becoming one of the Shia 
of Ahl al-Bayt is to renounce those that oppose Ahl al-Bayt First and foremost comes renunciation and then you have wala. Then you have your loyalty and our loyalty to Ahl al-Bayt. It's not that a person can have loyalty but still have a connection, obedience, acceptance for the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt and that's why the ulama come and say, for this reason, they come and they say, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to declare him as God, what does he say? He says, say, la ilaha illallah. Say, there is no God but Allah. Renunciation comes first and then acceptance comes after. Then acceptance comes after Jamil. This is what the Imam salam is trying to say. Some, for, some people come in and hear these words, they hear the words of Ahl al-Bayt and say, in that case, we should not unite. In that case, we should not listen to what others have to say. In that case, we should just go tunnel vision and just read our words and that's it and not know what else is out there. No. That's not what the Imam salam is saying. It's not wrong for us to read the works of our fellow brothers and sisters. It's not wrong for us to see what is said and why it's said and the reasoning behind it. It's not wrong within itself. As long as you know you're not going to be influenced to fall off the straight path. No. Meaning is that we should not be influenced and we should not conform and leave our aqaid, our beliefs, our ideas because of this idea of unity. Because of this idea of unity. Yes, certain things are to be done in certain times and in certain places and certain environments. Sure, certain things are to be left for their respective environments, respective places. Yes, but to conform, to leave what we believe in, to accept something that Ahl al-Bayt outwardly denied is in one way or another rejecting Ahl al-Bayt Or at the very least, it would be a reason why Ahl al-Bayt would reject me. Just the same way that Anwan al-Basri was turned away. Just the same way that Anwan al-Basri is turned away. If someone wants to take from Ahl al-Bayt, they can't take from the enemy of Ahl al-Bayt Or they cannot take from those who stand in the way or oppose Ahl al-Bayt Both of them cannot happen at the same time. Jami, we'll keep going. Let's check on. He says, فَاغْتَمَمْتُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ when I heard this, I became extremely sad. And I left him. He says, as I left, I said in myself, if he saw any goodness in me, he would not have turned me away. He would not have turned me away and, and more or less rejected me. Here's very important. The ulama really stress on this. What do, you, what do you say? So I went directly to Masjid Rasulullah. I went to the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi I sent my salams to Rasulullah. And I went to The next day, the next day or, or, in the afternoon, I, I believe it could go both ways. Regardless, sometime after, sometime after, I went back to a place called Ar-Rawdah in Masjid Rasulullah. There's a place called Ar-Rawdah. I prayed in Ar-Rawdah two rak'at. I ask you, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Jafar. I ask you, Ya Allah. To soften the heart of Jafar for me. And that you give me some of his knowledge. So that I can find your true path. What did Anwan al-Basri do? He went straight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his pursuit of knowledge. Some of us, my brothers and sisters, think that we can do it alone. This is the biggest disease any person can have, myself included. Some of us 
think that we can do it alone. And this is the biggest mistake of the person who wants to trek, follow that path of servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person who thinks that they can do this alone, that it is in their hands, and they don't need the guidance of God to get to God himself, has already fallen off the path. It's already fallen off the path. The person who wants to move towards God needs God. Needs God. And the person who thinks that they can do it alone is no different than Qarun. Who's Qarun? Qarun lived at the time of Nabi Musa. And Qarun was so rich, so rich, that he had camels to hold the keys or men, strong men, to hold the keys of the chests he had treasure in. And imagine you need strong men or camels to hold the keys of the chests of treasure that you have, not the chests themselves, the keys to the chests. What did he say? That I, he said, I got this much money. I got this rich, these riches, this wealth. From my knowledge, from what I did, from my actions. I got it from myself. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that, that moment took Qarun and his wealth in one swoop. It is said the earth itself opened and swallowed the treasures of Qarun. Whether Qarun was with the treasure or he was outside the treasure. treasure. Nonetheless, the treasure itself, the riches of Qarun were taken in the blink of an eye. As a lesson for me and you, don't we... ...without Allah Himself. That's why in the hadith, we see the one who truly thanks God, the one who truly thanks God, is the one who knows that his ability to thank is from God. The one who wants to praise God must understand that for every time they praise God and thank God for what he has given them, he or she must thank God for allowing them to give thanks. So this is You find this in Munajat, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. You find this in the du'as of Imam al-Sajjad and in the hadith as well. Don't we ever think we can do this without God? Don't you ever think that you can get to spiritual completion without God? No. Ever. And this is what Anwan al-Basri understood. And that's why the Imam alayhi salam later on acts differently with him. And you're going to see, inshallah. We're probably going to leave that last part till tomorrow. That's what we're going to do. Jameen. So I went back to my house, he says. I went back to, to um, I went back to my house, مغتمن. I went back to my house and I was sad. And I did not go to Malik bin Anas. There, my brothers and sisters, was the key. I did not go to Malik bin Anas. I realized. Essentially, what he's saying is, I realize that if somebody wants to have the love of Jafar al-Sadiq, they cannot have the love of the person who opposes, openly opposes Jafar al-Sadiq in that same heart. Why did I go back? From the love that I had for Jafar in my heart. That's why I didn't go back to Malik. He realized a person who truly wants hub Ahl al-Bayt, the love of Ahl al-Bayt, must leave those who oppose Ahl al-Bayt. When it comes to knowledge, the source is Ahl al-Bayt. We can't have both sources together. When it comes to love, the same applies. We can't have the love of Ahl al-Bayt and the love of those who oppose them in that same place. It, it does not work. They're not mutually exclusive. No. Rather, having one means you can't have the other. 
And having this one means you can't have its counterpart. And that's how it works. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. And so Malik, or so Anwan realized this and understood this. So Anwan did two things. He left Malik and went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asked him, and asked him to soften the heart of Jafar al-Sadiq for him to be able to accept the knowledge, accept the light of Jafar. Jameel, Jameel. He said, I went back home and I didn't leave my house and only for, except for the wajib salat. In other words, he closed himself off. He closed himself off. Until I had no more patience. When my chest was closed up, that's it. I couldn't take it anymore. When my chest was closing and that's it. I wasn't able to live anymore. Except that I knew that Jafar would accept me. He said, I put my shoes on. I put my cloak on. And I went towards the house of Jafar. And this was after I prayed Al-Asr prayer. When I went to the house, I asked for permission to go in. Who comes to the door? Servant. He says, what is your need? What is, what is it that you desire? What I desire is to say salam for a sharif the honorable one. Back then, back then, even after Imam al-Mahdi, Allah ta'ala, Faraja Sharif's occultation, it was common for them to call a Sayyid, the one who was connected to Rasulullah in his lineage, a sharif the honorable one. So if he says a sharif he means a Sayyid, Jimmy. Faqal, the khadim, the servant says, huwa qa'imun fi musallah, he's praying right now. فَجَلَسْتُ بِحَذَاءِ الْبَابِ بِحِذَاءِ الْبَابِ So Anwan says, I sat beside the door and I sat there and waited. Waited for the Imam to finish his prayer. فَمَا لَبِثْتُ إِلَّا يَسِيرًا إِذْ خَرَجَ خَادِمٌ I did not sit except for some time until a servant comes out and says, أُدْخُلْ عَلَى بَرَكَةِ اللَّهِ Come in with the grace of God. Here we hear one more thing. We see one more thing, one more point. What is it? Anwan al-Basri waited. He was patient. He sat at the door of the Imam and waited. He did not turn away when the Khadim, when the servant told him the Imam is not ready for you. The Imam is busy. He cannot see you right now. He did not walk away. Telling us, telling us that the person who wants knowledge must have patience must have patience for knowledge in his pursuit or her pursuit for knowledge. For sometimes knowledge is heavy. Sometimes knowledge itself is hard to bear. You must sit and study. And sometimes the, the issue or the, the, the knowledge, the, the facts, whatever is that you're learning will not stick. A person who really wants knowledge for God will be patient and will not quit. That's why you find some of our ulama studied the same exact subject six, seven, eight times over for them to understand it. It is said, said, Sayyid Abdul Hassan Sharaf al Din, one of our greatest scholars, he was known to be very eloquent. He was asked, Why, how are you so eloquent? How are you so eloquent? Why are you so eloquent? Were you just born this way? He said, No. I did the book of eloquence, Kitab al balagha I studied the book of eloquence that we take in Hawza, not once, not twice, not three times, not three times, more than eight times, more than eight times, exceeding maybe even 10 times. I studied that book. And that's why I'm as eloquent as I am today. Other ulama took al-mantiq six times. Go to the, if you go to the biography of some of our greatest scholars, the basic, basic, basic study subjects in Hausa, they repeated them multiple times. 
so that they can they are sure they understand the material patience patience وقلت السلام على الشريف ادخل على بركة الله فدخلت وسلمت عليه so I entered and I said my salams and this is where we are going to say our salams we're going to stop here inshallah and tomorrow we're going to keep moving forward and see what the Imam alayhi salam tells Anwan al-Basri and I tell you my brothers and sisters tune in tomorrow because the words of the Imam are some of the most beautiful words I have ever honestly 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 I have ever 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 read in a book so tune in tomorrow and you'll see what the imam alayhi salam said aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum as'aluhu ta'ala ya'fu anna wa yaghfir lana wa yarhamna innahu ni'ma al-mawla wa ni'ma al-nasir wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala sayidina muhammad wa alihi at-tahirin